our last presentation is from, I'm not sure if he's in the room. It's, oh, yep, yeah, Hafiz, there you are. Hello. So we have Hafiz Mohammed Abdurrahman, who's a PhD student at the University of New South Wales. Thanks a lot. Um, so thanks for the introduction. Um, so my name is Hafiz. Um, so I'm doing some work on uh, water treatment. And as a part of the PhD, uh, one of my tasks is to uh, initially analyze the uh, uh, risk of the xenobiotic organic compounds. We also call them inner emerging contaminants or organic micropollutants. There are multiple names of them. Um, so this is part of my PhD research where we collected the data of uh, different emerging contaminants in gray water, then we check their ecological and health risk and the overall aim to come up with a nature-based solution uh, to treat these xenobiotic organic compounds. Uh, so the motivation, uh, you have heard a lot of things about the water scarcity, um, but uh, in my opinion, I think it's very hard to imagine the water scarcity when you are privileged with a lot of water uh, this could be an issue where the people don't have the water. And uh, I assume that uh, our coming generations might not be uh, such privileged to have such an ample amount of water and the quality that we are uh, experiencing not right now. So it's our duty to do something so our coming generations can have some quality or quantity of water left for themselves. Um, so base, because of this water scarcity, there are a lot of uh, technologies that are coming uh, and adopted by different countries. One of these is seawater desalination, uh, but they are quite energy intensive and uh, they are not a centralized solution for the water treatment. So because we do have these issues mostly into the remote communities, so we need to come up with a more sustainable solution to tackle this water scarcity. So one of the potential solution is to use the existing water resources uh, such as gray water uh, that is in an ample quantity for instance, it's all approximately 120 liter per person per day. And it constitutes about 75% of total wastewater. So if we are able to treat such large quantity of gray water, it will not only help to tackle the water scarcity, but it also reduce the burden on our sewage systems. Um, but the issue is um, the gray water contains a lot of pollutants and these are increasing because of the extensive use of our personal care products that includes dyes, detergents, soaps, and shampoos. Um, so we need to see how, how much these contaminants are gathering in this water and we need to come up with some guidelines to see uh, if these, uh, this water source can be used for portable or non-portable applications. So for the research gap, uh, the existing literature have very limited studies on uh, gray water treatment and mostly they are focused on conventional parameters that includes the uh, nutrients removal that for instance, total carbon, total nitrogen removal or E. coli removal and there are no stringent guidelines about the emerging contaminants, despite gray water is a known source of many emerging contaminants, such as xenobiotic organic compounds. So one task was to gather the information uh, on the gray water from the published data, and uh, just to check a risk about these things, uh, and then to get, come up with the main idea of removing these pollutants or propose an uh, idea how we can remove in a centralized way these emerging contaminants. So initially uh, we did some risk assessment work that includes the ecological risk assessment um, using the risk quotient uh, that is a pretty standard um, procedure, although it's a very conservative approach, but it gives us the idea. Uh, so we have used uh, uh, from the literature, we use the concentration of the xenobiotic organic compounds and we uh, use the PNEC value that is normally endpoint toxicity value uh, that we analyze for non-targeted organisms such as fish, 
algae or the invertebrates. Uh, we run the uh, risk assessment and um, uh, it's, it came out that because the variation into the concentration is very high uh, in the cray water, uh, because it is highly dependent on the location or the, the people behavior. Uh, so we found that uh, there are a lot of micro pollutants uh, that uh, fell into the category of the high risk. Um, although most of them or the mean value is slightly lower than the one that is the uh, end point. Uh, but uh, we still uh, concluded that there are a lot of things that will be harmful if this gray water will be uh, given untreated to the aquatic environment. Uh, similarly, we developed some uh, risk scenarios for the non-portable usage of gray water that includes, for instance, if we have shower, toilet flushing, garden irrigation, or the car wash. Uh, for that scenarios, we develop some exposure pathways that includes the accidental ingestions during these uh, non-portable usage or the dermal exposures. Uh, so we take a lot of values based on the um, on these scenarios, like how much will be the frequency, how much is the dosage, uh, how long a people can usually do this uh, garden irrigation or car wash. So we used all of the available guidelines and the uh, data on the literature to develop these case scenarios. And then we assess the risk based on uh, the accidental ingestion or the dermal exposure divided by uh, RFT values. Uh, so if you see the toilet flushing and the shower, the toilet flushing values are uh, in a few of the micro pollutants uh, give a moderate risk, but most of them are in a low risk value. But if we have this uh, during the shower thing, because of this dermal exposure, the larger dermal exposure, a uh, few of the chemicals are in a high risk uh, category. Similarly, we have uh, done this for the garden irrigation and car washing stuff. Uh, and it includes the guidelines based on if we have the warmer days or the cold days. Um, uh, and then we have this combined hazards. Again, a uh, few of the chemicals do fall into moderate category. Uh, uh, the one thing that I need to mention is these risk assessment scenarios are conservative because uh, there are very limited studies on the gray water, uh, around 10 to 12 studies that have mentioned this concentration. Uh, and these are individual concentrations and we can expect more than a uh, lot of Xenobiotics organic compound in a single water stream, and their combined impact would be much higher if they don't treat it properly. So this was one of the initial part to just check uh, the risk of these micro pollutants, uh, and then we move towards the uh, a nature-based solution to treat these micro pollutants, and we come up with this uh, aesthetic approach we called green walls or vertical gardens that we can use to treat this uh, gray water by natural phenomena. For instance, in a green walls, it's a combination of plant, media, and microbes. And we expect that the polluted water when passed through this plant and media, we can come up with a clean water. Uh, for this thing, um, I have tested few, uh, few chemicals and uh, I shortlisted the chemicals based on their physiochemical properties. For instance, if they are hydrophilic or hydrophobic or they are charged. And then we use different media types. Uh, these are mostly natural media types, low cost, and they can have a very good substrate for the plant growth. So we use such media types that can easily be used in a green wall system. And the overall aim to check whether these media or the green walls can create these xenobiotic organic compounds from gray water. So initial was our batch study that includes green wall and xenobiotics. We did the adsorption batch experiments. Uh, we used uh, uh, some uh, minerals like zeolite and perlite and some uh, carbonaceous waste material like the date seeds, coffee grinds, and coca coir. So the carbonaceous waste materials give us a very good removal of this hydrophobic or, 
or relatively uh, moderate solubility pollutants. Uh, zeolite was good for the hydrophilic pollutants. However, the perlite was not very effective. Uh, but the idea of these green walls, because we want to treat larger quantity of gray water, so we, we don't want to use a single media because this coco coir was the best one, um, but it's a very fine media, so we want to mix it with a coarser media type so to avoid clogging in our system. So in next task, we did some column experiments where we use different media mix and the wide range of xenobiotic organic compounds. Uh, and uh, we get a pretty good removal of the most of the pollutants uh, in, in, in our media system. We also checked the processes involved in the removal uh, and uh, adsorption or biodegradation, and we concluded that most of these antibiotic uh, compounds have very high affinity for organic uh, media, and uh, it, it can be well removed using carbonaceous media. Uh, based on our media mix configuration, we move towards our green wall system. That's, that's one of the study that I'm doing right now. It's the last part of my PhD work where we have uh, the optimized media and the plants. Uh, we are using different plant species uh, and we are testing different operational conditions to come up with the best combination of plant and media that can remove wider range of xenobiotic organic compounds from clear water. So uh, this is pretty much from my side. Um, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? Or if you're on Zoom and you have questions, um, we can also pop them in the chat and we can take them as well. We do have one question here in the audience, Safis. Just one second. Sorry? We do have one question coming. Okay, sure. Hey, Hafiz, can you hear me? Yes. All right, that was a great talk. Uh, I was Thanks. just wondering for the microbial composition of your green walls, do you just use like the ambient natively occurring bacteria in whatever media you're using, or do you use some sort of inoculum to introduce specific types? of bacteria into your media? Uh, so uh, right now in our system, we are just the ambient conditions and whatever is developing based on the uh, environmental conditions. In our last experiments, we haven't used any inoculum uh, and we haven't tested the microbial community itself. Uh, but the idea is once we are done with this operational condition and experiments, we have this mature media and we will destruct these uh, columns or our parts to see what's the impact of what sort of microbial community is there and how what sort of microbial community is developed with the passage of time and how they are interacting with the uh, microbial Awesome, thank you.